the dwelling place of the, uh, of the Spirit in chapter 2, verses 20 to, to, uh, to 22. He tells us we're given boldness and confident access to God in chapter 3, verse 12. But we're made powerful beyond our imagination in chapter 3, verse 20. That we're given the unity of the, of the Spirit and the bond of peace in chapter 4, verse 3. We're individually and uniquely gifted by Christ in chapter 4, verse 7. We're blessed with uh, specially gifted leaders to equip us in the work of ministry in chapter 2, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. But we are taught by Jesus Christ himself in chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. That we are given a new self in God's holy likeness in chapter 4, verse 24. That we are made light in chapter 5, verse 28. That we, or chapter 5, verse 8. That we are offered the fullness of the Holy Spirit in chapter 5, verse 18. That we are given the instructions and resources to make all relationships with, with others what God intends them to be in, in uh, Ephesians 5, 21 through chapter 6, verse 9. And then last of all, we are given God's full armor to make us victorious against Satan and his demonic forces, which is what we just read in, in chapter 6, verse 10 and 17. And so now you're saying, I didn't catch half of that. So my challenge to you is go to Lifeway and buy the Ephesians commentary by John MacArthur um, and just read that. Uh, it's on page 377. All right. Um, but uh, what I want us to see is this, is that Paul lays out throughout the book of Ephesians, these are the blessings, these are the things that are yours because you placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You're a believer, you're leaning into the gospel now, and so these are your benefits. This is what happens to the little life of a believer. And then he continues in verse 18, and he says, now pray at all times. Now this can get a little confusing, but what, what John MacArthur says is this, is after a believer contemplates the breathtaking list of blessings that he or she possesses as a child of God, Paul realizes the great danger that is likely to follow. Temptation to self-satisfaction and spiritual areas. And so Paul lists these things and he says, and you need to pray. And the reason that you need to pray is because you probably are going to begin to walk around with this high and mighty attitude. I am a blessed child of God. I uh, am God's workmanship. There are people that walk around churches, right? They're like, I'm God's workmanship. I'm God's blessing to this church. I'm this, I'm that. And what Paul says is this, is you must pray at all times. And the reason why is because prayer is us leaning into the gospel. That prayer is us trusting in what, what God has accomplished through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Prayer is us reminding ourselves that I can't do anything in my own strength and in my own power, but God can. And so prayer, a lot of times we think, well, you know, prayer is just me listing my request before God. Prayer is me, you know, just kind of complaining a little bit to God. Well, God, I wish you'd do this. I wish you'd do that. Kind of stamping our feet a little bit. But, but prayer is a gospel-centered thing, something that we, we must do because it's us trusting in the plan and the provision of God. It's us trusting in the sovereignty of God. Prayer is us leaning into the gospel. And ladies and gentlemen, if we don't lean into the gospel, into the fact that Jesus Christ came and lived the sinless, spotless, perfect life that you and I couldn't, and then he died this horrible, horrific death that you and I should have died, if we can't lean into that, if we can't place our trust and our faith in that, we're walking on dangerous ground because what the church is about, what draws us together more than anything, it isn't a common... Um, you know, personal preference. What it is, is it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And prayer is a way that we become a gospel-centered community, a gospel-centered family, because in that we trust in God. We trust in the power, the provision, the plan, the providence of God. And so what I want us to see, the foundation we lay before anything else is this, is the gospel. Because that's our foundation. If we ever forget, if we ever move on to other trivial things and we forget to lay the foundation of the gospel, where are we headed? What direction are we headed in? And so the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, and you'll get tired of hearing me say it every time I stand up in front of a group of people, but the gospel is what we're all about. And it's what we have to be about. Amen. Because it's that that gives us hope, meaning, and purpose. It gives us the comfort that we so desperately need in our lives. And so prayer is an exercise in leaning into the gospel and trusting the gospel. 
Why? Because the only way that we can pray and the only way that we can communicate with God is because Jesus Christ came and he lived the life that you and I couldn't live and he died the death of he reconciled us to God. He reconciled us to God. And so the gospel is the foundation of prayer. It's, it's the foundation that connects us and it's also the foundation that connects us in prayer. And so Paul reminds us, pray at all times. And prayer at all times is a, is a theme throughout a, a lot of Paul's letters. In, um, in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, he mentions the frequency, the consistency of prayer. Also in Philippians 4, 6, in Colossians 4, 2, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Remember, pray continually or pray without ceasing. So prayer is a constant thing for Paul. Why? Because Paul wants us to lean into the gospel. To lean into what Jesus accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection. And so there is our foundation. And now we begin to build on it and say, well, what is it that we're connecting in? How do we connect in prayer? And Paul continues in verse 18, and he, verses 18, 19, and 20. And he gives us two things that we should pray for. You ready? So he says, pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. He says, here's the first request. He says, to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance. Don't give up. Press in. Keep praying. And he says this, making supplication for all the saints. And so the first thing that we should learn that we really need to grasp about being connected in prayer is that we, we do this as we pray for one another. This isn't rocket science. This isn't difficult. This isn't brain surgery. This, it, it's simple. Pray for all believers Pray for the fellow saints. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And now here is the reason why. Because again, prayer changes things. Any of you ever had a disagreement with somebody? Come on. I don't see enough hands. Any of you, any of you just got people that you just kind of don't like? Come on. I've got to play. I mean, you got to get a, Come on now. How many of us have those people that maybe are sitting in this building right now? DJ, don't talk about me like that way. Um, no, we in, in churches you've got one end of the spectrum from from age to the to the other end. You've got one end of the spectrum from life experience to the other end. You've got so many different personalities and preferences just in this church, much less other churches in this community, much less in this region, in this state. All churches, when you really think about it, you look at, if anybody just walked in this church and you look across this and, and they, they look at the different types of people that are here, I, I bet some people, a lost person, just scratching their head and saying, what is it? Why are they here but here's the issue with that. Those differences sometimes breed conflict. Sometimes it, it, we want our way. We want things to be the way that we prefer it. We want things to be the way that we like it. That we want everybody to kind of submit to what it is that we want to do or what it is that we want to be about. And so there's that frustration. There's that tension. There's, there's conflict. And a lot of times what we do as a result of that conflict and that tension is that we find people who support us and our ideas and our preferences and we run over here and we talk and we huddle up and we do this and we do that while that other person on the other end, they're over here, they're huddled up and, they're and then it just continues to fester and fester and fester. But what Paul tells us is this, is that what we should do instead of having conflict is we should pray for one another, not pray for one another and say, God, I wish you'd change that person's heart because they are so stubborn. Right? Because that's what we typically do, right? Come on, let's let's get honest with ourselves. We, that's what we pray. That's the way we pray. I wish they would change. That we would pray, God, change my heart towards this person. God, change my heart towards that person. Because we're not walking in fellowship. We're not walking in unity. And that is what the gospel does. It drives us together. It doesn't drive us apart. It doesn't drive us to have different factions and different groups. And it doesn't drive us to conflict. It drives us together. And so maybe, maybe just maybe what we need to do is to pray that God would change our hearts towards other people. Maybe what we need to pray for our fellow believers is this, is that they would lean into the gospel. Maybe there's someone in this church that you know that 
maybe they're just not leaning into the gospel the way that they ought to. And, and maybe that becomes your prayer that God, that they would lean into you and they would trust in you above all else. But it also comes to us being transparent with each other. That we begin to allow people to know the struggles that are in our own hearts, in our own lives, so that we can go to those people. We can go to our church family. We can go to our fellow believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and say, you know what? This is what I'm struggling with, and this is the way that it's, that it's affecting me. And maybe then that person can go and pray for us. One of the things that we do on Sunday nights is... Um, for our prayer services, we have poster board around the church and, and people go and, and write their prayer requests on, on, on those. And then we, we pray for those, those things as, as a part of our prayer service. And, and for, for the longest time, one of the things that, that I would see on those, those uh, cards was that our church would become a praying church. And I believe that at some level, our church is. I mean, I, I get like 17 emails a day from the, the prayer chain. Uh, that, that we're, and that's great. That we're, we're trusting in each other. We're opening up and we're saying, these, these are the struggles. This is what's going on in my life. But maybe we just need to be a little bit more transparent. Because sometimes it's, you know, this is going on, this person's sick. And that's, that's fine. But maybe we just need to say, you know, look, I'm, I'm struggling with depression. And I wish my brothers and sisters in Christ would pray for me. I'm not really. I'm like, I'm, but... But, but maybe that's the kind of transparency that we need. And so prayer for others begins when we become transparent with one another. But it also helps us reconcile and repair relationships that need to be repaired. And so praying at all times for all the saints. We would pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because it changes the way that we interact with them. It changes the way that we value that person. And so maybe there's a difference. Maybe there's a conflict right now. And maybe what you need to do today during the invitation time is that you need to get your knees and you need to pray, God, change me. Don't worry about that other person yet. But God, change me first, the way that I feel about them, the way that I think about them. God, change me first. And so prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ. How do we become a gospel-centered community? We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so my question to you now is this. Is who are you praying for? Who are you praying for? How does this shape your relationship with them? How does it shape your relationship with them? And then also here's another question. Do you take encouragement knowing that someone else is praying for you? So Paul continues now. We're almost actually done. Alright. Verse 19. Um, Paul says this, and also for me, that words may be given to me in the opening and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And so Paul's second request, the second challenge for the church at Ephesus is this. Pray first and foremost for your brothers and sisters in Christ and now pray for me. And what we learn from that is this, is that we would pray for our leaders. Paul planted this church. Paul was invested in this church. Paul gave a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to these people. He poured in the lives of other people who led that church. And so Paul says, pray for me. And this kind of sounds a little like, kind of like I'm begging for you, but I think it's okay. And, and I think that, that my fellow staff members would, would, would stand with me and say this. We need your prayers. We covet your prayers. Although coveting is a sin, we still covet your prayers. We, we need them. We need you to pray for us. Why? Because this isn't easy. Not just the standing up here preaching. This isn't easy. But, but the other day today, trying to equip you to do the work of ministry like Paul said in, 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 in his letter to the, the Ephesian Christians, this isn't easy. This is a, it's a fearful thing. There, there, there's a, an eternity is at stake with this stuff. And so our, our hope and our prayer is that you would pray for us. As we come to the conclusion of this series, I hope that's the thing that resounds in you, is that you would pray for your staff, but not just for your staff, your deacons, your committee members, your Sunday school teachers, 
your outreach director, that you would pray for your leaders, the people who are guiding you, who are shepherding you, because what we're going to end up doing is we're going to trust in ourselves above all else. And what do we need to do is we need to trust in Christ and the finished, accomplished work of Jesus Christ. And so pray, pray, church, that that's what we would do. Amen. That we wouldn't bow down to the opinions of other people, that we wouldn't bow down to the opinions of ourselves, but that we would follow the will of God, the, 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 the plan of God, that we would do what it is that God is burning our heart for. Not that what I've burned my heart for, David's burned his heart for, David's burned his heart for, but that what God has led us to do, what God has placed us here for. Church, pray for us. And, and here's the issue, though. Some of you are like, well, I don't like you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm from Louisiana. But pray for me anyway, because maybe God would change your heart in that. Because here's the thing, and a lot of times we, we sit around church, and, and I can say this because I grew up in church, and I would go have Sunday lunches with my family, and we would sit, and, and we would come, well, the preacher did this today, and he did that today, and, you know, and sometimes it would be petty things, like we had a preacher one time that he literally wore the same shirt every week uh, for, is it like seven weeks? My mom's here. That's like seven weeks. And it was so bad that my grandpa even recognized. And he was like, what well, a preacher sure likes that church a whole lot. So I'll let you know how bad things get when, when Papa realizes it. And we would go and we would sit and we would complain about little petty nothing things. And you're probably going to go home today. Oh, right? You're going to go home and you're going to complain about this or that. Maybe instead, and this is a challenge, I, I prayed just before, um, before I came in here that God would do this work in my heart and in my life first and foremost. But maybe what we need to do before we sit and complain is this. We need to pray. Pray for our pastor. Pray for our worship leader. Pray for your student and family minister. Pray for your Sunday school teacher. Maybe you don't like the way that they teach. Maybe you don't like the things that are going on. Maybe you need to pray. Because I can tell you this from experience, complaining doesn't fix it. Complaining doesn't fix it. I think it's something we all could, could really agree with and, and realize. 